Hello, it's the week beginning, Monday the 15th of March, and this is Business Unwrapped, a series of bonus podcasts brought to you by Tech UK and the China British Business Council. Today, in the last of this three-part series, we'll be exploring the ethical implications for UK companies doing business with China. And tech companies working in China can learn more at the UK government's new website, gov.uk slash digital and tech China. I'm Ollie Mann, and this is Business Unwrapped. And joining me today from the week's digital team is the boss man himself, Holden Frith. Hello, Holden. Hi. And our special guest today is James McGregor, China chairman of the communications consultancy APCO Worldwide. Uh, James, you have um, quite literally written the book on how to do business with China, uh, and you live there too. So what has been the biggest change that you've seen over the past few years? Well, China's taken a, a, a much more difficult trajectory in the last, I don't know, decade or so from the global financial crisis, actually. That was a turning point where China decided that their system was better. They did not open their current account, as IMF told them. They survived the Asian financial crisis, the global financial crisis. They looked at Wall Street as being a mess and decided that their system was better and they're going to stick with it and go with it. And that changed a lot of attitudes. And to what extent does that reflect on how they feel about foreign businesses? Um, Because, you know, this whole series we've been talking about, if you as a British business want to work with China, do they want to work with us? If you're doing business in China, you are there to serve China in their mind. You know, it's not about helping you make money or being nice to you. It's very transactional. It's very zero sum. If your business can help China and you make money at the same time, that's a good thing. If what you're doing is something China doesn't want, you will not find market share. It's, it, and that has become a, a finer and finer point on things as China has become uh, more rich, more powerful, and its companies have become very strong competitors. Interesting. Okay, I think we might have those words ringing in our ears as we go through the rest of this show. Uh, Holden, I have asked you to choose a new story to guide us through this prickly Topic of ethics in Chinese business, what have you gone with? This is the story of a comprehensive agreement that led to widespread dissent. European leaders are keen to to express their views on this. And the question is whether it's going to be part of the uh, negotiation on, on CHI or uh, other uh, economic uh, um, ne- you know, discussions between the EU and China. I'm not. I'm not sure they can do very much than than speaking out. To be mm-hmm. honest, and certainly that's the role of the European Parliament as well. And and you have very strong, uh, you know, uh, pro human rights lobby there. Um, and and Hong Kong and and the, the case of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang are, are are both on top of the list. A clip from the South China Morning Post's China Geopolitics podcast discussing the response in the European Parliament to CHI, as they pronounce it there, the EU's China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. Oh, hold on, that all sounds very dense. You're here to make this nice and accessible for me. What is the story? The story is that this deal is really intended to increase trade between China and the EU, and it was signed at the end of last year. But some member states now are accusing the EU of ignoring concerns about human rights and going around national leaders in order to advance the cause of trade. And while this story is specifically about the EU, it indicates a broader debate about engaging in China and one that we've seen play out here in the UK too. Yes, and in Australia as well, and you know, to an extent in the States, although obviously they've taken very tough positions on China recently. I mean, it basically it comes down to the obvious business opportunity of the world's second largest global economy and then the ethical questions that that authoritarian regime keep challenging us with. Yes and it seems to be something that's felt very acutely here and there's been a a sort of palpable shift in policy really and you know the both sides have been have been expressed by by senior ministers we talked in the first episode about Boris Johnson describing himself recently as a sinophile and suggesting he'd like to build links between the two countries but since then we've also had Dominic Raab the foreign secretary condemning Chinese government actions in Xinjiang and Hong Kong and talking explicitly about human rights abuses so both of these both of these um, sides of the debate are clearly getting an airing well yes but you see, James, we tend to see in the West, certainly journalists, these two things bound up together, human rights and then 
business. But uh, from what you were saying earlier, I wonder if, if a lot of people, especially a lot of businesses in China, really do see things like that. They're, they're kind of separate issues, I imagine, to a lot of Chinese people. Well, they, they are and they aren't. Um, you know, so many uh, foreign companies have been doing business in China for decades. They've got staffs of tens, you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands. Um, they have people that have worked for them for many years. So they're, you know, they're kind of just going along like they always have. But questions come up because today your brand is, is supposed to stand for more than a product. Uh, what you sell is supposed to stand for your values. Your employees expect the company to stand for values. Meanwhile, your Chinese employees are really not informed about what's really going on because of censorship. And in many cases, the, the misinformation leads them to have attitudes that what's going on in Hong Kong and what's going on in Xinjiang either don't exist or um, are something that is um, okay to happen. And so it's really difficult for companies just dealing internally, much less dealing with the outside world and what they think of you. Life's got a lot more, gotten a lot more complicated. I talk to um, my friends who are running multinationals in China, and they just say they do the best to have honest conversations with their employees about what is going on and listening to them, but also giving what the company thinks. Everybody is struggling. This has gotten very bad in the last couple of years. China was on a trajectory before where there were problems, but it was, it was, it, there was an upward trajectory. That is now gone. So everybody's feeling um, uncomfortable. I suppose there was a sense, there used to be a sense, Holden, with Western politicians that somehow dialogue could combat some of these issues. You know, if you were talking about um, human rights like, I don't know, freedom of speech or factory conditions. But uh, as James suggested, because this is now escalated to people's freedom to exist, essentially, and allegations of genocide, that's kind of, you, you can't really broach that, can you, in a business conversation? It's, it's something that the two states fundamentally will disagree on. I think there's two elements here. And one, one is the escalation on the Chinese side that has, has sort of sharpened these ethical questions. And the other is perhaps that there was once a, a slightly more optimistic, perhaps naive view in the West that by trading, by sending Western companies with Western values into China and engaging at a business level, it would be possible to export culture and politics and ideas of democracy and freedom too. And I think it's quite clear now that that, that certainly hasn't been successful within the timescale that, that might have been hoped. But we were talking last week about clubhouse and it's somewhat short-lived arrival in China but clearly that did you know that did spark conversations that did allow some light into areas that that otherwise wouldn't have been covered so it's it was perhaps a view that was too optimistic in the short term but maybe not entirely untrue in the long term. Okay I'm keen to get to some practical advice for businesses who actually do want to open up in China because that's what we're here to do but before I do I suppose that the elephant in the room tying all this together James is some people would say if you're really concerned about ethics you shouldn't be doing business with China at all, period. Yeah, well, that is a legitimate view in one way. But in the other way, we live in a, we live in a world where if, for many companies, if you're not in the China market, you'll lose out globally because somebody else is going to be in that market. So we've never really faced a situation where a country that is this powerful and this deeply embedded in the global economy and global financial system has had this kind of behavior. So we're, we're, we're into something new right now. Companies at this point are just saying, look, I'm going to do business. I'm going to be very ethical and legal in the way I do business. I'm going to treat my employees well. And hopefully by my presence there, I will make, you know, I will, I will make a contribution into China having, you know, maybe I won't transform the country, but I will at least make a contribution to the people I work with and the, and the people I partner with on, on bringing the, you know, our values in. Uh, you're not going to change the Communist Party, but uh, disengaging from China is not the solution because that's not going to lead anybody in, into a good place. OK, so let's walk through then in baby steps for British companies that are going to engage. Uh, Holden, we were talking about in episode one of this series that a sensible thing to do in a country that has over 100 cities of more than a million people is to partner with not just one Chinese organization on the ground, but perhaps dozens, to make sure you're covering the country well, doing your due diligence. It's very easy to say these things. Harder to know in concrete terms what you can actually do. 
ethically, you know, human rights abuses is not something that companies list on companies' house. So how do you do your due diligence there? There's, there's a lot of different aspects of this that need to be considered and a lot of it will depend in the particular industry your company is is working in. But I think one of the key things here is you, you will have to seek expert advice if this isn't something you're aware of. One of the things that makes this so complicated is the the Chinese policy known as the, the military civil fusion, which means that the, the lines between Chinese government, military and business, especially big business, is much more blurred than they often are in the West. And so if you are working particularly in the high tech sector, where Chinese high tech companies are often explicitly linked with government programs, government national security programs, and often government mass surveillance programs that can be used to further the, the government's aims, including in places like Xinjiang, where, the, where, um, where human rights abuses are um, reportedly taking place. And these are the sorts of things which, depending on the company, may be relatively straightforward to uncover or may be quite buried within supply chains. So it is something that where due diligence is very important, but, um, but yes, ex- expert assistance will be necessary. But also kind of impossible in that case, James, because those companies might at any point, I mean, this is the law in China, might at any point be asked to share that data with the military. So, you know, it's not as if you can say, well, this company does that and this company doesn't they all potentially could. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem is it's been kind of overblown. You know, if you're a Chinese company, you're under the thumb of the government and you're going to hand over everything to them so you can't be trusted, so no Chinese company can be trusted. Uh, that's quite overblown. Good. Okay, so tell us who the good guys are and how we find them then. Well, you um, actually, you just, you, you when you're going into business in China, um, the problem with Western businesses, uh, especially Americans, is they're they're impatient. They go into China, they want to do a quick deal, and you know get you know get home for the weekend. Um, you uh, if you're going to do business in China, you need to do uh, due diligence and more due diligence and more due diligence. You got to take your time. You got to uh, control your expectations. You also have to really think: Should you be there? It's a tough market. And it takes an enormous amount of time from your top executives. And so often you you get in there and it's really kind of a small market for you compared to what you're doing around the rest of the world. And it's taking an enormous amount of time of your man of management. So, you know, don't get too caught up in the China dream. Really evaluate if this is the right place for you. Where, Holden, have um, companies come foul of ethical implications? Uh, You know, are there some big names that give us a warning from history? This, I mean, probably the biggest um, of recent history would be um, HSBC. Um, Small family enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> they got embroiled in the questions around Hong Kong uh, last summer, and specifically the national security law that was applied there. And they became under intense pressure from Beijing to publicly support the new national security law, which is regarded as repressive by Hong Kong uh, democracy campaigners. And they did eventually fold and they did they eventually supported the Chinese government in, in introducing that law, which led to huge protests in Hong Kong and also um, from activists around the world. But interestingly, it also didn't really seem to help them with the Chinese government, at least publicly. That It seemed that whatever statement they made didn't go far enough for Beijing, but ended up upsetting a lot of people around the world. So they really found themselves caught between these two, these two forces. Yeah, I mean, how do you reassure people in both countries, Britain and China, that you're doing the right thing in terms of ethics? I suppose keeping a paper trail, James, is an important thing, so you can at least demonstrate your workings. This is what we've tried to do. We've acted in good faith. Well, you just you very much follow your 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 legal and ethical standards that you have anywhere else in the world. And so, um, as we were talking earlier, supply chains, you do due diligence on your supply chains and your partners. Who are they? Where do they trace back to? Because it's gotten very difficult with all these sanctions coming out of uh, the White House uh, during Trump that uh, seem to be sticking under Biden. And also, you know, more and more scrutiny out of the out of the EU and 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 others. You, you just got to try to do the right thing in China as much as you do in the rest of the world. What does doing the right thing for Chinese people mean? I mean, that's different, isn't it? How do you say to Chinese people what are they looking for when they're looking for an ethical company? Look, uh, many of the Chinese companies are top-down enterprises that are very. Um, 
you know, very rigid and very political. People have liked working for multinationals because there's a path upwards, there's a, there's a career path, there's ethics, um, there's standards, there's ways of operating. People get treated de decently. What you do is you, you, um, you, know, you give people opportunities, you train them, you bring them to Britain for a while to learn how you, they, to do things and send them home to run your business. Now, I've got to be very careful with that because I've seen companies over localize and mess up. There's a balance between having um, your staff at home and also having uh, Chinese staff work together. You got to layer that. You know, you were, uh, let me bring this up. You were talking about business failures in, in China. I mean, Britain's had a couple of spectacular ones. What is the name of your Home Depot? B&O or something like that? B&Q? B&Q came in and cratered. Tesco came in and had to give it up. What went wrong in those instances, do you think? I think B&Q, because it was a DIY model, right? Where you, 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 you buy stuff there and then you do it yourself. Chinese people don't do it themselves. If you're going to do remodeling, you, you have somebody do it for you. But sometimes you wouldn't know, would you, whether a country is ready to embrace your different way of doing things. I mean, I'm thinking about IKEA coming to Britain, for example. You know, that in itself is sort of extreme DIY, isn't it? Which you might have said British people weren't ready for, but it turned out we were. Well, I mean, even IKEA in China, when you buy your stuff at IKEA in China, there's a counter where you sign up and a guy comes over to your house and puts it together in five minutes. I need to get my furniture from Ikea in China. <laughs> I'd save myself a lot of frustrating weekends. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, uh, I've seen a lot of comp I've seen more companies uh, um, really damage themselves in China because of headquarters, not China. The headquarters says, no, we do it this way. All the, This is how we do it around the world. We're going to do it that way in China. And the model doesn't work. And also, you got too many lawyers and compliance officers that want everything in clear black and white. Um, where everything in China is gray. And I'm not saying you do unethical things or illegal things, but you figure out what is the honest and ethical way to do it within their system um, and, and, and still works within your system without, you know, laws in China are not clear. They're all very vague so that the authorities can enforce them whatever way they want. And that drives um, rigid corporate lawyers crazy. I mean, Holden, I'm curious, you know, if, if you were starting a business, how would you avoid the difficult questions from people like you? Uh, well, not, not avoid, but like, you know, how would you prepare yourself for a journalist who was going digging around on these kinds of ethical questions? I think the you know, the thing that always alerts people like me to something that might have gone wrong is evasiveness and a reluctance to talk about something. So I think if you're going into business in China, then then thinking about all of these questions before you start that work is the first step towards being able to tell an honest story about the steps you've taken to eliminate the risk as far as possible that you're going to be involved in anything you wouldn't want to to be known about but more broadly and then and then trying to pursue that as as far as you can as far as you possibly can and being as open and honest as you can to your customers and to anyone else asking questions i think that's when 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 journalists when customers when people see companies trying to do the right thing they're much more willing to believe that there is a, an ethical basis to that business than that than if they feel they're either being spun a story or or not told about something that's being shrouded in secrecy and i suppose whatever the obstacles james if you're genuinely a globalist, if you're an internationalist, if you're running a business and you believe that you want to be in China because you, you want to be in China, you want to be able to tell people in your country that you're all over the world, but also you'd like Chinese people to engage with your product, there, there might be a positive result to this. You know, we've been talking about all the dangers and the pitfalls. There can be good that can come from bringing your business to China too. Yeah, well, let me also tell you that the new economic policy that Xi Jinping is pushing is called dual circulation. And his goal is to make the world more dependent on China and make China less dependent on the world. Um, he also, his goal is for China's economic growth to be driven by its domestic market. So there's going to be opportunities for companies that are engaged in logistics, retail, and consumer products that Chinese people want because they want their people spending money. They want their consumers buzzing so that they're not dependent on the outside world for growth and they 
reduce their vulnerabilities. So there are opportunities, absolutely. I, and and um, if you have products that Chinese people want, um, yeah. And then you find the right partnerships to sell those products, you know, the right, the right agents, the right websites, Many companies are doing very well in that regard because, and Chinese consumers are very, very discerning and they're very fickle because they're always trying something new, but they, they trust foreign products. Apart from DIY. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they trust foreign products. They trust foreign brand names because the quality has, has, has been good. And I suppose holding, holding on to your ethical concerns, but not tarring every business that's based in China with the same brush. Yes, I think that that's absolutely right. And there, there may well be opportunities where the business case and the ethical base can all line up. One of the areas of, of great focus for the, the Chinese government at the moment is, is green energy. That's also an area where there is great expertise in, in the UK. So being able to go into China with the, the aim of reducing the world's dependence on carbon feels like it could be a win-win situation. Thank you. Lots to digest there. Holden Frith and uh, James McGregor from APCO Worldwide. Uh, that is it for this edition of Business Unwrapped and indeed this series, which has been supported by Tech UK and the China British Business Council. For more information about the opportunities and challenges of working in China, visit china.theweek.co.uk. And for the latest UK government advice, gov.uk slash digital and tech China. For more podcasts from the week, do search for The Week Unwrapped on your podcast app of choice and click subscribe if you haven't already. And I will be on your phone hosting a new episode of our weekly news show every Friday. I've been Ollie Mann. Our music is by Tom Morby, the producer Sophie King at Rethink Audio. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>